We are back here on our big broadcast. We are coast to coast and border to border on iHeartRadio and also AMFM. 247.com today, and uh, we are doing our uh, Thursday night wrestling show, but we are also uh, chatting with a basically anything this guy touches <laughs> turns to gold. And uh, Ron Fuller is with us today, and a uh, retired professional wrestler. Uh, the Tennessee stud. He's also an author now, and uh, you've owned a few hockey teams. Uh, pretty much anything you've touched has turned to gold. Uh, first of all, let's start there. You've got the Midas touch, my friend. Tell me a little bit about what you've well, been able to do over your time. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I guess I'm just blessed by the good Lord. Uh, you know, and I've had some success in several different types of businesses. Started off in wrestling, which my family is the oldest and largest wrestling family in the history of professional wrestling. Yeah. And, uh, and then went, as you said, into hockey. Uh, uh, when uh, wrestling crashed about the time that Vince Jr. decided he wanted to be the man and own it all, <laughs> uh, I went into hockey and, uh, and had some very good success there in minor league hockey. Owned a couple of teams that did great. Uh, then uh, retired for a while. Uh, then I got into ADT as a security business and and became uh, in a period of about 12 years in ADT the the uh, 12th largest dealer in North America for ADT. Good lord! And I got out of that <laughs> and uh, during the, the little time when I uh, right after my hockey experience, I, I wrote a book. But I left it in the drawer for 20 years, and about two years ago, I pulled it out of the drawer, and I said, you know, I'm going to finish this, and I'm going to get this done. And uh, now I'm an author. And it's oddly enough, I'm not a wrestling, it's not a wrestling story. It's not about my life. It's, a, it's about a, a lion that I dreamed about one night. Yes. And, and started writing. Yes. Like, like I'm going to be a writer. Uh, <laughs> That's what I was telling myself anyway. <laughs> I'm going to become a writer, you know, and uh, and it, it took 20 years for me to to get the book out and uh, and published and you know and it's it's going great guns it's doing good. So this is a uh, you know because I, I I talk to writers all the time I've 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 interviewed Dean Koontz and Mary Higgins Clark and a lot of these folks and I've also interviewed the the lesser known. Uh, writers as well and a lot of them don't have kind of the story that you basically dreamed up and then came up with tell us about this because th 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 this is amazing that you dreamed this you put this together and then you just shelved the book for several years yeah yeah kind of it is a crazy deal and a, a pretty crazy story but that's kind of like my life you know I'm, I never know which where, where I'm going next but I, I, I moved, I, I retired after hockey, and I went to the Florida Keys, lived for three years, and uh, came back to the Smoky Mountains in Knoxville, just outside of Knoxville. I lived pretty, yeah. right on the edge of the Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, and I was there for three years at this stint. This was uh, 1997 to 2000, around 2001. And one night I had a dream about a lion, and and I, I kept going to sleep, and then I'd wake up. It would it would scare me some of it, and I was like, "What in the world is this all about?" I go back to sleep, and then the dream continued. So I got up the next morning, and I said, "I want to write a book. I'm going to write a book about this dream." <laughs> you know, and uh, that's crazy. You know, and, I mean, how do you, you know, how do you do that? And uh, but anyway, so I, I go down to the base of my house, and I spend two years basically uh, writing this story. And, uh, you know, then I took the book and about the time I got ready to get it published and really work on it, I got interested in going back to work and going back into another business, ADT security business. And, yeah. And, uh, and I just put my book in a drawer in uh, my bedroom for 20 years. It sat there. And then a couple of years ago, I, I looked at it again. I went, wait a minute. I need to do something with this thing. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, I just, uh, I had a real good Studcast fan who, who uh, listened to the show all the time. He's a writer. Uh, yeah. He's in the same genre. He's got five books out. And uh, he, he said, let me read your book. Send it to me. And I sent it to him. And, 
He read it in one night. He called me back the next day and he goes, my God, man, you got to do this. You got to write, you got to get this out. You know, it's amazing. So, you know, you just don't know when you're writing something, whether you got something or not, though. That's always the case. Uh, you never know. Uh, I guess that's the case for all writers. And first time you write a book, you never know whether it's going to be successful, whether it's going to be liked. But so far, it's only been out about six weeks or so. It's uh, really been... Uh, my reviews on Amazon are, are amazing to me. I look at them and I'm like, wow, I may be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> look at these things. These people are really saying this about my book. Some people compare it to Jaws. I'm like, Whoa, that's wait, awesome. Now, just a minute. That's know? awesome. So, uh, so, you know, I'm just real happy with the results I've gotten so far and the reaction and the reviews are just amazing. And so, uh, it's, a uh, it's been an experience for me, like most other businesses I've gotten. Into, yes. You know? I don't know very much about them. I mean, I got into hockey. I've never seen a hockey game, and I bought a hockey team. You know, I, mean, uh, I saw one hockey game. In fact, I didn't watch the whole game. I watched two periods of it. I saw a fight, and I went to the building manager and said, how'd I get in this? And they turned me on to the league. And, uh, and boy, awesome. they were real happy to hear that there was a wrestler that wanted to become a Owner of a hockey team. Oh, boy, were they like, wow, yeah. wait a minute now, Ron. You know, uh, you're not going to have these goon teams, are you, man? Uh, you're going to hire you a decent, good coach, surely, man. You know, they were so concerned about what, what I was going to do to hockey. And uh, what I did to hockey lit hockey up, uh, you know. I, I was the first one to ever do Amazing. a nice introduction. and. Uh, we did it even before the Chicago Bulls. We were maybe the first in all of all of indoor sports to do a wow a, a, a game introduction. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that's so, you great. Know, I mean, we lit it up in other ways. Thank God uh, they were very happy about that. But we also lit up the crowds. I mean, that league was averaging fifteen hundred a game. Yeah. And uh, our opening night, we did six thousand. Before the year was over, we did nine thousand. The next year, we went to Cincinnati. We did 10,000 plus 34 games out of 36 games. Wow. In our second year there. Uh, wow. Sold out. The building would hold 10,200. We did 10,200 for minor league hockey, 34 out of 36 <laughs> games. That is awesome. It's amazing. Uh, the record's still there, you know, the, some of those attendance records. But I've just been very lucky, man. I, I've been lucky to... Uh, timing is, they say timing is everything in life. And uh, and it certainly seems to be that way for me in business. Uh, I got in hockey the year that Gretzky moved from Canada to L.A. And uh, we bought a franchise, my two partners and I, we bought a franchise. And uh, two weeks later, Gretzky made the move to L.A. And I told him, I said, guys, I think this move is going to light up pro hockey. It's going to be bigger than ever just this one guy going to America and uh, operating out of America rather than Canada. And, uh, and it turned out to be the case. I mean, it just, it was perfect timing. Uh, we went in just on the top of Gretzky going to LA and, and wow, uh, it was, it was beautiful. Well, this book Brutus, uh, by our guest tonight, Ron Fuller Welch is a, uh, absolutely amazing read. Uh, it, it, you look at, this on Amazon, and it has five-star reviews. Uh, people are comparing it to Jaws. Uh, it is an incredible, incredible uh, piece of business here. Uh, my co-host John has joined us. John, we, we, we've got Ron Fuller with us tonight. You mean the Tennessee stud Ron Fuller? <laughs> uh, that's what some people call me. Now, my brother, he argues about that a little bit. You know, but uh, he stole it from you. You know it. <laughs> you would like to anyway. <laughs> so, uh, how you doing, John? I'm doing great, sir. I mean, I was telling um, James earlier, yours is the one podcast that I listen to religiously because I just love how you got a format, and you're a great storyteller too. So, well, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I got a lot of history. My family has a tremendous history. We're at 100 years now in wrestling. Yeah. Uh, my family, my granddad started, uh, actually was trained by 
by an old, nasty, mean son of a gun out west called uh, Dutch Mantel, the original <laughs> Dutch Mantel, and, uh, and was sent to Columbus, Ohio to become a professional wrestler in about, about 1920, uh, in the early 20s. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's been, a, it's been a, I've had a wonderful life, and, and I, I'm blessed with uh, all these stories uh, because when you wrestle and you travel the world, you see so many things and you get to experience life, not just in this country, but in so many other countries. And it's a, it's a, it's a mind boggling experience. And, yep. Yep. and it, it's such, it's, it's such a big world we live in, I guess is a good way to put it. Uh, it's great, great to have the opportunity to see so much of it. I've been lucky. Yeah. You experienced a lot for a young guy in the business. Cause I remember you were talking about when you went over to Australia on your podcast, um, did they take a lot of the younger guys over there, or was it just you were that, you know, no, the fact they, your whole family was? And that same crew when I was in Australia was, uh, was his name was Mike McCord, Darren. He becomes Austin Idol. Uh, right. Scott yep. Casey was in that crew. Uh, oh, it was it was filled. Uh, Jimmy Golden was in. My cousin Jimmy Golden was in that crew. It was filled with really, really young and talented wrestlers. Uh, and then they sprinkled in all these great veterans from all over the world. They did it so differently in Australia. Uh, we had Mario Milano from Italy. We had uh, Spiros Arion from Greece. Uh, we had uh, we had a Hindu a Hindu wrestler from India. Uh, it, it was just guys from all over the world, and and that was a real experience too. You get, being able to wrestle those different styles. Uh, guys that just uh, you know didn't wrestle like Americans do, and uh, that was really good, especially. And I was I was at that point uh, about three years in the business, uh, and I really believed that 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 trip, that three months I spent in Australia, it changed my career uh, overnight. I came home as a totally different wrestler than the one I left as. Wow, we have got a great guest with us tonight. Ron Fuller joins us. He's got a brand new book out. It's called Brutus. Now, your book, you, you mentioned uh, when you were on uh, Jim Cornette's podcast that you, you went and researched a lot of these places. Yeah. Uh, that is just fascinating to me because I, I will have different authors on this show, and they will you know, tell me all sorts of different things about how, well, there's this and there's that in the book, and then I'll be like, okay, well, Take me through the writing process is always one of my one of my famous questions, and they just tell me, "Oh well, you know, I wrote some pages, and then we had a book." And it's like with you, you went and researched and scouted these places. Yeah, yeah, and and not only that, I, you know, because this my book is about a man eating lion that gets captured in Africa. And he, he, instead of being killed like he should have probably been, uh, but he happened to be uh, captured by two two cat two hunters that that want they sold the animals to zoos, and uh, <laughs> so they didn't they want to kill any they didn't want to kill even a man eating lion they just didn't feel good about killing God's creatures and yeah so this lion gets sent to an American zoo, uh, and no one at the zoo knows he's a man eating lion they don't tell him that they don't no one finds that out. And uh, then they end up in a situation to where they're dealing with a lion like they've never seen before. Happens to be not only a man eater, but he's the largest lion in the in the history of of uh, captivity. You know, I mean, he's a monstrous wow. lion. And so I went to the Knoxville <laughs> Zoo where I lived. I lived in Knoxville, Tennessee, outside of Knoxville, and I spent weeks there. Uh, with uh, with the caretaker, a carnivore caretaker, the guy that's yeah. handling lions and things, and and uh, he we talked about everything. We talked about uh, you know because I had to dream. I knew this was a man eating lion. It says you know uh, I had to ask him the question. You know why why how does a lion become a man eater and and does that mean that he doesn't eat other food and you know I got all of the particulars. I even got the because I was going to have a part in the book where. Uh, a guy, uh, well, he actually is going to, to have his his uncle killed by the lion, and uh, and he because he hates the way the, his uncle treats him, because his uncle lost his leg to this lion in Africa, yeah. and then he gets an opportunity to get his hands on that same lion, uh, a few years later, 
and he has him sent to his zoo because he's the hair, head caretaker <laughs> and, at that zoo. And, uh, and so he, uh, so he ends up there. Both of them end up t- tranquilizing this lion at one point. And uh, this guy, his nephew, is one of the main characters, and he's one of those. He's pretty much out of the deliverance. One of those Appalachian <laughs> guys that, that you know, you this guy is trouble, you know. And uh, and but he he doesn't really, as the story develops, he becomes more trouble. Uh, he's kind of a pitiful character in the beginning of the book, and uh, so you know, I, yeah, I did the research, and then I also once I got into where the line gets out into the Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, then I started uh, writing about particular places in the park. And uh, I went then at that point into the park, uh, day after day. I went to every place I wrote about. I said, I want to stand on the ground I'm going to write about. I think that is fantastic that you were able to do all that and that you, you wanted to make that a goal. Yeah, you know, and and that park is so massive, it's just huge. And uh, uh, so, you know, I spent time in North Carolina. I spent time in Tennessee. Uh, you know, that 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 park is in five states, four or five states. It's just a monstrous <laughs> place. And when you see the the uh, and and it's the most visited national park in America, uh, Smoky Mountains National Park. It's uh, yeah. by far the most visited park. Uh-huh. And uh, people, a lot of people have been there, and they know what I'm talking about. If you've never been in that park, you cannot imagine how difficult it would be to find a lion in that park. It would just be unbelievable to, uh, to, 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 to be able to do it. And uh, in the book, uh, I, I have characters from Australia. I have characters from Africa. Uh, the guy that actually captures him is going to have to come to America and do it again, you know, uh, because who the hell knows how to track a lion in America, you know? <laughs> yes. We don't have a whole lot of lions in our neighborhoods and running around our countryside. Yeah. You know, it's not like hunting a, a deer. It's a quite a different procedure. So, so the book's got a little bit of everything in it. Actually, a whole lot of things that I didn't intend for it to be in, but at some point, and I don't know if that's the same way for all authors, but for me, this book kind of just took me, took over. It, it like took me places that that I didn't dream. Some of this, it's like, wait a minute now, where are we going here? You know. But then I go down and sit down at night and start to work on it. It was like, wow, I, I see it, I see it. And uh, so it was been a, it's been a great experience for me. Really, and you know, I've done a lot of things, but. Uh, but writing a book is totally different, and, and, and you just don't know. But it's almost like when you go to in the hockey business. When I was in the minor league hockey business, there was, it was not as successful. It wasn't a great way to make money. Uh, nobody was drawing money. Nobody was drawing big crowds back in those yeah. days in yeah. the minor leagues. And uh, we kind of set the pace. I mean, what we did in Nashville, what we did in Cincinnati, Everybody went. They we bought a franchise for twenty five thousand. Uh, two years later, the franchises were five hundred thousand. Uh, two years after that, they were a million. <laughs> yeah, and we went from wow. Four teams when we got started four teams in the league when we got started. It went to twenty four. It was holy like, smokes. There were teams in uh, Alaska. Now the East Coast Hockey League has teams in Alaska. It's amazing what that league went to, but we. We lit them up. We let everybody know that, that there's money here. There's, there's audience here. Uh, but what we did was we, we brought wrestling to hockey. We yes. Entertained. Yes. We did things that had never been done. In well, and this is the thing, and, and you being such an old school guy, Ron, I think you would, you know, you would do something like that and, and, and bring the, the wrestling to the hockey because I, I have – I have done some. Uh, I I wouldn't say I've, I've I've done you know big major things, but I have uh, I I've done some like little smoker fights and kickboxing matches and stuff the last couple of years, and I have brought like pro wrestling to the kickboxing arena. <laughs> I've got entrances. I've got you know different different things I do. You know we'll cut promos on social media we'll do all these things and these these mma guys and these kickboxing guys they just don't know what the hell to think because they're just so used to we show up we put on gloves we beat the hell out of each other they don't understand 
the show concept of it. What was it like with you trying to explain to these hockey guys, we're going to do entertainment stuff and we're going to bring pro wrestling to hockey? Well, I didn't tell them. <laughs> uh, and and they, when a few of them showed up on opening night in Nashville, oh, they all came to my office after the first period. After they saw their first ever game introduction, they saw instead of uh, the skaters just skated out, uh, nobody even on the microphone said, "Hey, welcome your team to the ice" or whatever. Yeah, I mean it was like. The, both teams skate out and they skate around in circles and they just, uh, you know, and then they finally drop the puck. And, you know, I was like, I watched that the first night when I went, first game I went to, and I went, gosh, my, what it, they, so what I did is uh, because we're in the South, I was in Nashville, Tennessee, and they were, there yeah. weren't a lot of hockey fans in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, People yeah. Much about it. <laughs> So I said, uh, I told my partners, I said, we got to entertain these people. We got to, we got to get them to come to see our entertainment long enough to learn the game. And if we can get them here for two months straight, and they learn how the game works, I said the game. They'll be great fans. Game. We yeah. will, we will make hockey fans out of them. That's awesome. Uh, first night uh, in Nashville, uh, we had two guys come in from the NHL. They sent a guy from one of uh, one of the teams out of Canada, sent a, just a guy down to come down and see what this wrestler is going to do to hockey, right? And another one out <laughs> of Chicago. They're spying on you, Ron. They're spying on you. Yeah, they came down. To, well, they came. I don't. I think they just wanted to find out what is this guy going to do. You know what I mean? Is he going to have a goon team? But what they saw, they didn't expect. Uh, I'm sure of it. And uh, after the first period, well, what we did that night is that they had had all these. Let's just skate around in a circle and let's drop the puck and let's play the game. And uh, so what we did that night is we t we had 6,000 people in 8,000 seat building, which everybody Jeez. said you're going to draw 500 people. They said you're going to die. You'll never make it through the first season. And I said, well, guys, we'll see. You know, we'll find out when we actually get the game time. First game. <laughs> First game, 6,000 people, and uh, then when it came time for the game, we just darkened the whole building. The building went black, and uh, everybody in the building kind of buzzed a little bit, and then we played uh, Bad to the Bone. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Da, 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 da. <laughs> then we started the big we had four spotlights. Awesome. We had them going all around the building, and we had bad to the bone going. And then we, for the first time ever in the history of hockey, introduced the entire team, player by player. And the other team, when we got started in this process, they lined up along the blue line. They just quit skating around in a circle because they they never seen it either. They're like, what are they doing? What are they and they're doing all over there? They're just watching the intro. And I told my players to prepare them two days earlier. I said, here's the way we're going to introduce you. We went through an introduction on ice in the middle of the afternoon. And I said, and I, and it, I said, have some fun with it, guys. Just do whatever you feel like. So we introduced. I had a great uh, re, uh, game announcer. And he had all the players with these nicknames and all. And a lot of fire and enthusiasm. <laughs> He had the people standing up, and then the last player on the team that got introduced, he skated out on the ice, he took his stick, and he dropped down on one knee, and he threw his stick out in front of him like a shotgun, and he just mowed down the whole other team. <laughs> he just went right down the line. Awesome. The building exploded like, wow, this is fun, right? And uh, got in the dressing room, and here came the two guys out of the NHL. They go, uh, what are you doing to our game? <laughs> oh, my God. I said, I'm making your game exciting, guys. What do you mean? What am I doing to your game? And they said, you don't do this. He goes, you don't introduce players. You don't turn the lights out. Play music. What in the hell are you doing? <laughs> I said, guys, I said, uh, tell me. I said, when all that started, how many people were standing on their feet? And uh, and the whole crowd was on their feet, right? And then I finally looked at them. I said, I bet both of you two were on your feet. <laughs> and, uh, and they looked at each other like, oh, hell, man, they got us, right? You know? Uh, uh, so it was. I think that's hilarious, though, that that the, the hockey guys, you know, are like, you're screwing up our game. You're letting the crowd know who we are. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. It's yeah, like, you know, that's the... Players. I mean, what the hell that's is wrong the with That's the gateway. With knowing who the hell these guys are. Yeah. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. What? And you know what was really amazing to me? So what stupid. I really loved about it, though, was about three years later, and I saw the San Jose Sharks, and they darkened their building, and they <laughs> played the music, and the players came out of the Sharks' mouth, They introduced and them. And I said, oh, look at these son of a guns now, man. <laughs> They're ruining uh, the game. <laughs> So, you know, I, my little league that I was in, the East Coast League, uh, the next year, everybody. Everybody, everybody introduced everybody. Opening. Everybody. It was like, and then it just went from there to the big time. It went to the Chicago Bulls the very next year. They had some Bulls. They sent the Bulls people, sent them some people down. They didn't know there was going to be a game introduction. And they, that was right before Jordan got involved. And when yep. Jordan went there, that's where they got their idea from was the Nashville Knights watching that game introduction. Like, wow, man, we got to do this. We, we got to do this. Music. We, 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 we got to have Michael Jordan and the Bulls come out to the Midnight Express music. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, John, j jump in there. A ask, ask Ron some questions. Oh, I'm just loving listening to him. That's like I say, I'm a religious listener to his podcast, but... Um, Mr. Fuller, I'm, I know you started with the Knoxville area on the southeastern, and then you bought, you know, your cousins, I think it was, the Fields. Yep. You bought yep. out what was left of Gulf Coast. Um, did you have any other areas that were, were trying to get you to buy them, or um, did you have any areas you like to work with? Because I know you and Eddie Graham were really close. Did you guys do a lot of talent exchange? Well, you know, I was a Southern promoter, uh, and Knoxville was a small territory, basically one city, but a yep. really, really strong audience in that city. And then we were, we drew, we drew crowds like they drew in Miami and in Harlan, Kentucky, and Hazard, Kentucky. I mean, four or five thousand <laughs> people. It was like you'd draw the whole population. Uh, Harlan, Kentucky had a sign out front when you entered the city, population three thousand. And uh, we draw 3,300 in the gym. I was like, yeah, well, everybody in town's here, guys. You know, <laughs> so uh, you know uh, it. It, uh, but I had wrestled all over the South, and my family had been in it for for three lifetimes. <laughs> I was the third generation, yeah. and both my father and my grandfather were not just wrestlers; they were promoters, and uh, they had built their own companies and. I had seen it done properly all around the country. I started out wrestling in Georgia. I spent four years wrestling in Florida. I went to Knoxville and started my first company. Uh, and what happened is during all those four, four years of getting ready to become an owner, I met so much great talent. I was so lucky. Florida was full of the Dick Slaters and the, yep. the Bob Orton Juniors. And, the, and I mean, it was just like, wow, all these young the Kevin Sullivan, the, these young digging, driving stars. And when I got to Knoxville, those boys wanted to come work for me. They were like buddies. And they go, Ron, <laughs> geez, you're selling out up there. Can I come there? You know? <laughs> so it was easy for me to get the talent. Uh, I worked, obviously, very closely with Eddie Graham. My father was uh, a part owner of the Georgia company. He was part owner right. of the Florida Territory. So he and Eddie were close personal friends. Uh, Eddie Graham, in my opinion, was one of the greatest minds in the history of wrestling. Yep. Uh, he just really knew. He had a, he had a p finger on the pulse of the whole sport. He knew how to make it work. And so had my dad. My dad drew monster crowds long before anybody ever did. He drew almost 40,000 people in Mobile, Alabama in 1958. Wow. Uh, he drew uh, 30,000, close to 30,000 in Memphis in 1959, 25,000 in Arizona wow. in, uh, in the early 60s. Uh, went to Atlanta and drew 30,000 in Ponce de Leon Baseball Stadium in 65. I mean, in a 10-year period of time, he drew four of the largest crowds in the history of the sport. Uh, you know, just had a real handle on it. And I got to see all that as a young guy. And, you know, and I knew I was going to be a wrestler. I played basketball at college, University of Miami and Clemson. Yeah. And, uh, you know, could have played pro ball maybe, you know. But I never wanted to do anything but wrestle. And when I got there and it became time to do it, I knew I knew a lot more than just a wrestler knew. I knew the business from the inside. I knew the business as a promoter. I knew the business as a wrestler. Uh, 
uh, all sides of it, and it, it made it simple for me. It made it easier for me. That's fantastic. Oh, it's it's great. Some of the stories. If you haven't listened to him, go back and listen to all of his studcast. But I like the when you were talking about like your grandpa, your dad, um, like that uh, the fight your dad had with what was a Mario Galento or Galento, yeah, or something. Dude, you just had me riveted. So I mean, and I'm not sucking up to you because I could do it much better if I was. But I just <laughs> love how you how you do everything. Um, uh, it's like I've you. tried to get people turned on to your podcast more, so I'm hoping well, I, I help some. It. I appreciate it. I love it. Uh, I never did a podcast, obviously. In fact, I left wrestling in 1988, sold my last company, which was USA Wrestling. I went back to Knoxville after I sold Continental, and I just had a basically the old territory that I'd had uh, back in the 70s. And uh, once I sold that and left in 88, I got into hockey. And I was out of wrestling until, uh, geez, 19, I guess 2018, maybe 2018. I got back and I went to a little uh, show in Dothan, a reunion show. And and uh, then I got to start doing my stud cast. And uh, I really like the stud cast because, uh, like you said, it's a formatted show. It's, it's, it's a telling of my history of my family, which, uh, you know, my family is the oldest and the largest. I don't think anybody's got a better wrestling story than my family. You know, we, 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 we basically built wrestling in the South. My granddad yeah. ran wrestling in 12 states at one time in the South. Wow. He was the king of wrestling, big time. So, you know, and I used to travel with him and what a character my granddad was. I mean, he was, he was, it was amazing the stories he had. It was like, and I, you know, and I, thank goodness I got, I've got my memory. Uh, thank goodness, uh, you know, I'm getting up in age a little bit, but I still remember those stories like he was telling them to me yesterday. <laughs> and, I, and, uh, and I got a ton of stories and, and that's where we're back to the book. I mean, yeah. you know. I didn't have that story, and all of a sudden I have a dream, and I now got all of a sudden you got the best this. Story I ever, best story I ever told is have, probably in that book. Have you thought about possibly seeing if you could get this book made into a movie or a TV show or something? Because it just the fact that it's got great reviews and it's it's a heck of a story, and pretty much everything you've ever done has been over the top successful. <laughs> Again, everything you touch is just yeah. succeeds. It's like, have you thought, you know, I got all these connections with people. Maybe I ought to just see if we get this thing made into a movie or a TV show. <laughs> well, actually, I've already, I've got a, because of my stud cast, I have a, a guy that works at Disney, and he's he's already... He's already, You're already pitching he's it. Book. He's read the book and he's That's already, awesome. you know, he's he's headed in that direction. You well, know? good. But this is not really a Disney story in a way. No, you know, it's, a, it's a maybe a little beyond a Disney story, <laughs> but he sees it, you know, and uh, and he knows a whole lot of people. Uh, yeah, I, the, this book is really funny. You know, when I got down toward the end of it, actually, uh, I started thinking that this might be a great story man it's it's gotten to be a really wonderful deal here uh maybe there could be a sequel so on the well and that was going to be my book, next question was it have you thought about doing a sequel or anything there, yeah well I, i've got to see i gotta sell a few more books first <laughs> i gotta I, I gotta get that first movie before i want to <laughs> make a second movie you know uh, but i really do believe i believe that the book has has legs i believe the yeah. book could be a tremendous movie I, I i think you know the first time i had a reviewer say i've read your book I, I, I think it reminds me of Jaws, and I was like, "Oh wow, wait just a minute, you know." But uh, if it if it if it is a Jaws, I think it could be as good as the movie Jaws. I honestly, do it's just a land Jaws rather than a yeah. Jaws. And that's and that's kind of the thing is that if 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 you you look at the reviews and you look at some of the different things, and and you really dig into the book and and what you've talked about here with you know, tracking the lion and all these, it's like, it basically is Jaws on land. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, uh, and, and, uh, I didn't, I, I did, you know, 
I had no idea when I started writing the book where the hell it was going, you know. Yeah. And uh, and and as it as it as it took me on the ride, you know, I was like every morning every morning I would go down and I would sit and look at what I'd done the night before, and I would say, wow. <laughs> Like, dang, this is really good, you know. So, <laughs> so it's a, you know, I, I think that it has possibilities. I mean, you know, I'm I'm waiting obviously to see it really what it's going to do as a book. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, I really appreciate uh, shows like this one and the opportunity to talk to people about it, uh, because when most people say the this guy's a wrestler and he's written a book, well, yeah. the first thing people say well it's about wrestling yes you know then when they say, hear that no it's not a wrestling book then they're like oh boy you know he's been hitting the head a bunch probably you know <laughs> one day he's gonna write something man, <laughs> yeah what's he doing yeah yeah what is he doing as a writer so you know uh so uh, I, it's been a great, like I say, the book has just been a phenomenal experience for me so far, and uh, I'd love to see it as a movie. Uh, in fact, I got real rambunctious uh, in the last six months, and I went ahead and uh, and did me a, a, a script for it. <laughs> if it wanted to go to the movie, <laughs> of course. It's be the guy that's going to that's going to piece it together and then tell the story the way it wants that I would like to have it told. Yeah. I think sometimes when you sell your book and somebody else writes a screenplay, you don't have the same story. Well, and I've, and I've seen that on a lot of occasions with folks who will, uh, you know, they'll, they'll be like, Oh, well the book was better than the movie. And it's because you're right, Ron, they, they sold it and somebody else got in there and went, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to add this to it. Yeah, yeah. They'd take away the the entire meaning of what you were trying to get accomplished there. Right. We've got Ron Fuller with us today, the Tennessee stud, and uh, we've also got John Mosier, too, my co-host, writing Shotgun as well. Uh, So, Ron, this this book that you've put here, uh, were you shocked when the reviews started piling in that you didn't get like one negative review out of this so far. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have not had one single thing, not a single review under five stars. I mean, yeah, it's, it's pretty it's, damn amazing to me. And when I go to every once in a while, I go to Amazon and I see that list of books sold, uh, you know, just growing like crazy. And I see those reviews. Uh, I'm blown away. I read them and I'm like, wow. You know, I'm thinking, man, I couldn't, I couldn't have paid somebody to write. One. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, gee, look at this! It's fun. It's unbelievable. So yeah, I'm really, really enjoying it. I'm, I'm, blow, I'm blown away by the experience actually, and I'm trying to get used to it. I haven't been here long enough, uh, and uh, this been happening long enough for me to, to really get a grasp of what's going on. But, but I would love to see it someday turn into a movie. I really would. I think yeah. it would be an extremely entertaining movie. I think it would be one of those movies that you'd be sitting on the edge of your seat for for most of it. Yeah. Well, it is a uh, it is an incredible book. It's called Brutus. It's available on Amazon. Uh, now, one of the things that you brought up earlier, which, uh, like John has said on a couple of occasions here, anything that you touch turns to gold, it seems. <laughs> Um, when you got out of the hockey part of it, when you sold the, when, when you got out of the hockey, hockey business, I guess, it, it, um, what motivated you to, to get out of that? Was it just, you'd had your fill or? Yeah. Uh, I, I kind of burned out on it after five years, um, because we were buying these new franchises and we were having to build, not, uh, you know, when you buy a hockey team, you have an organization there, but yeah. uh, we we didn't do it that way. We bought a franchise and we built our own organization. And there's a lot of work in that, a uh, tremendous amount of work in it. And uh, and uh, we had such great success. I mean, we couldn't draw any more people in Cincinnati than what the Cincinnati Gardens would hold, and that was ten thousand two hundred for hockey. And my dad had the same problem. Uh, maybe I got that from my father. My father loved to go into these territories that were dead and then build them. 
and build and, them uh, up. One, yeah, yeah, and and build them, and then have that big monster event in which you draw uh, 35, 40,000 people in a football yeah. stadium somewhere, and uh, and then he would just uh, say, "I'm ready to go. I've done it. <laughs> I've done it. Yeah, you know, yeah, I've done it. I, you know, and 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 I remember as a kid, I never talked to him about it, but I realized after a while. Look, I mean, every time he gets to one of these big, huge crowds, we we leave. Yeah. <laughs> like, why? You know why? And I finally figured out. I think he just had that. He wanted to build something big, and uh, and then he wanted to start all over someplace else and do it again. Yeah. It was that drive to make a success out of something that nobody was able to make a success out of. Memphis, Tennessee is a great example. It was a yes. It was never a good yes. wrestling city until my dad came there in the late fifties, and just cranked it up. Well, I mean, wow. You, you bring you bring up Tennessee, and I always. <laughs> Uh, I've I've been around, you know, all all these different, you know, Kansas wrestling territories and different things. But we took a trip to, of all places, Dyersburg, Tennessee, uh, a couple years ago. And I they happened to have a wrestling show that weekend. And it was the craziest deal. It was everybody was still buying into kayfabe. And people were booing the villains and cheering the heroes and all these things. And I'm like, wow, no wonder wrestling is still big down in the South. Because they were all buying into it still. Because there's, there's been a lot of Kansas companies and a lot of Colorado places that I've been to where they... I, I don't know if they just don't buy into it anymore or what it is. Uh, why is it that Tennessee is still big into wrestling after all these years? Well, uh, I'll start off with you, James. Uh, you know where I was born? <laughs> yes, that's why I brought that up. <laughs> Dyersburg, Tennessee. Dyersburg, Tennessee. Dyersburg, yes. Tennessee. And, uh, uh, Tennessee is a tremendous wrestling state, uh, professional wrestling state. As yeah, lot, as most of the South. Yes, a, a great deal of the Southern United States is just great wrestling country. Fans love their wrestling. We're lucky too. We had the Bob Armstrongs who recently passed. Oh yeah, passed. guys like that that just. Uh, I don't care if you didn't like wrestling and you didn't believe a thing about it, you're gonna sit and watch Bob Armstrong. <laughs> you're gonna listen yes. to Bob Armstrong oh, yes. talk, right? Yes. Uh, John, yes, you are. You know that. It, oh yeah. He, he just he's ju he was just he was what pro wrestling was all about. And uh, somebody asked me, he said, "Well, what if Bob Armstrong had gone to New York to WWE or WWF?" I said, "Bob Armstrong would have owned that son of a gun. He would have been the biggest star ever yep. up there." You know, I mean. Uh, yep. And there were so many guys in the southern part of the country that were so good so tremendous at what they did that uh they, they had they gone to the north uh, they had vince jr senior as an example who used to bring in some guys every once in a while i wrestled in madison square garden he invited me to come there in 73 yes. and wrestle and uh he used to bring guys out of florida there and uh put them on that show and when he did uh, we were the highlight of the show i watched the show the night i worked madison square garden and uh and uh I probably had the best match of the night, and uh, I know when uh, Jack Briscoe went up there before he was world champion, I know he drove him crazy. I know that, you know, uh, whoever went there from the South, uh, just it was totally different fans. It was totally yeah. different attitude. That's what you were seeing in Dyersburg. Uh, and those people had grown up seeing my granddad and his brothers wrestle in that town many years before that. Uh, my granddad trained his first wrestling bear there in the 1930s. <laughs> that is awesome. Ironburg, Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> my dad trained a wrestling bear there. Him and um, and him and his uncle, uh, Lester Welch, about the same age. And uh, there's a great story. I got a great story about that when they trained this bear, and uh, they would the they had him in their backyard, and they didn't didn't they stake him out, and they they didn't even put him in a cage. And uh, so on Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, whenever they needed to take him to the to the building where the ring was to work out and teach him, 
uh, they would put him in the back seat of their car. And, <laughs> and he didn't have a muzzle on him. They didn't have a muzzle on him. And uh, my dad told me one time that him and Lester pulled up to Dyersburg, and, uh, and there's only like four corners there. Oh, four yeah. House and, and four red lights used to be in the old days when I was a kid. <laughs> dad said they pulled up there. Uh, on a Sunday morning, and he said there was an old drunk standing there, and he was bobbing and weaving about to fall down. And he said they stopped the car, and the, the bear had his head out the window right by the drunk, you know. And the drunk was, look, finally got a real funny look on his face, and and uh, Dad kind of noticed he had spotted the bear, and he says, uh, "What do you think of what do you think of my dog?" And the guy says, "I thought that was a bar." <laughs> <laughs> it really was bear. Who rides around with a bear in their back seat? There ought to be a couple of crazy wrestlers. <laughs> now, I remember you saying, Mr. Fuller, that um, on one of your podcasts that a lot of the success of the wrestling was the fact that the only thing you had competing with you in some of those states was college sports. You didn't have any pro teams down there yet. And you guys made sure that you took advantage of that. And um, I liked what you said once. You said that, you know, they may not think wrestling's real, but they're going to think that you guys are all real when you when they came and seen you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Believability. I mean, that, and that, uh, I think that uh, separates uh, some of the Southern wrestling from what went on in the North and the Northeast, uh, yeah. especially the Northeast uh Oh, you, you know, believe it. We, God, man, uh, you had to be believable if you were going to wrestle in the South. And uh, and you you had to be willing to do crazy things in my dad's <laughs> days, my granddad's days. They, they busted your hard ways. And, you know, I mean, they, you did just absolutely crazy, stupid things almost to make people believe. And, uh, and once they start believing, that's like your conversation about Dyersburg again. Back yeah. there, seeing those fans in Dyersburg. Uh, once you believe, uh, it's pretty hard. It's pretty. You got to be really have some really bad wrestling to make people then turn their mi- turn their minds off and say, "Well, no, that's not real." Uh, and and what we used to do back in the when I started in the seventies, way before my time in the seventies in the South. Uh, Wrestling was real. And if you didn't believe yeah. it, all you had to do was tell one of the wrestlers, <laughs> I don't think it's real. And if you made that mistake, you got a real quick lesson then, you know, about whether it was real or not. Uh, so it, it was, it's a different uh, sport. That sport is, is very much different in all the different parts of the country you go to. And I've wrestled in most all of them. And I know what the difference is. There were certain areas. It kind of depended on who owned it. Vern Gagne had a tremendous re- respect for wrestling. Yes. Because of a tremendous amateur background. Yes. And uh, his wrestling was solid. It was like Southern wrestling. You found the only the only really true Northern wrestling that that uh, that had any comparison with the su- Southern wrestling was Vern Gagne's territory, the AWA. Uh, and uh, it, every place you went, uh, styles were different. Uh, you know, Los Angeles and the place down there, that in that area, oh, wow, not, not kind of very much similar to uh, Vince Senior. Yeah. Uh, it just, it just wasn't the same. But uh, uh, wrestling is a tr- was a tremendous sport, and I say was because you know uh, I hate I hate where it's at now. It, it's. Uh, it's 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 it, it just it's it saddens me because my family spent all their life in it and i did too i left it because of what happened and uh, vince decided yeah. he wanted to have it all and the way he did it uh, uh the way he took wrestlers away from territories and uh just uh just had and put it brought them back in to compete with you it was really really a bad uh, bad way to end up uh, owning everything and uh and now where it's at is uh it's a shame i wish uh, somebody else had gotten into that seat about in the late 1980s a southern <laughs> promoter eddie graham i wish eddie graham i wish my father i wish somebody uh you know uh, had had made the move and and, and decided to go that direction well i when, could have done it with my company continental when i you... had an opportunity to get that national tv i went to new york wow and i and uh, and I talked to NBC, 
uh, and uh, I was there for two days, and uh, and uh, I backed away from it because I did not want to eliminate everybody. I got yeah. to thinking, yeah, I'm going to have so many enemies because I've got this national television program, and I was scared to to take it because I would have lost my friendship with Eddie Graham and and a lot of these other promoters and guys that I'd worked with and worked for. Uh, Muchnick and all the guys, St. Louis wow. area, uh, the big names would have been extremely scared of me, and I think it would have changed my relationship with them. I, and I walked away from that deal. I should have took it because Vince took it about uh, two years later. Yeah, he jumped on it. Uh, wow. So uh, what 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 could have been? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I went to hockey and I had a great time. I really <laughs> love hockey. I, I'll tell you that the, the, the fact that, that I think my favorite uh, comment you've made tonight is when the NHL guys walked into the locker room and said, what are you doing to our sport? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. They, they were, they were very upset. You know, I finally, I, I got upset because they were really, really giving me hell about it basically. And I, and I said, uh, I finally said, listen, guys, I said, I don't give a damn what y'all think about it. I said, I own this team. And I said, uh, we're in Nashville, Tennessee. I said, a lot of these people that are out there in that building tonight, they don't know a damn thing about hockey. And yeah. I said, I'm going to entertain the hell out of them, by God, until they learn this game. And I said, you come back here in about three months, and you'll have some hockey fans in the South. By yep. God. And, uh, yep. you know, and that's basically what we did for And I'll we tell said, you, that's a hell of a strategy yeah. there, Ron. You know, educate, you know, get, get, them in the, get them in the building and then educate them. And then they find out they're, you know, they learn about the sport and they're fans of hockey. I, I did, it happened to me. <laughs> I had to learn the game. <laughs> on a hockey team and I couldn't figure out what icing was for a long time. I used to have to get somebody down one of the players. Hey, what the hell is that all about? What, what, what are the, oh, well, you can't shoot the puck all the way down the ice. I mean, it was the simplest deals, you know, but, uh, it's, it's part of the, it's part of the, you got to understand sport. Uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing about wrestling is anybody can understand wrestling. You don't yes. have to train somebody to understand wrestling. Yes. You can watch five minutes of it and go, oh, I like this. You know, <laughs> I understand exactly. It's all about one, two, three. The bell rings. It rings. You start and one, two, three. Somebody gets counted out. The bell rings and it's over. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, <laughs> it's a simple, simple thing. But when it's done properly, it's one of the most beautiful sports that uh, it's ever been. You know, it's it's it's. When it's done by the Jack Briscoes and the Dory Funk Juniors, yep. uh, and uh, yep. those kind of matches, uh, there isn't a isn't a person on earth that could watch one of those hour Broadways that they used to do, and and go away saying, "Wow, that was fake. That, that wasn't real." <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you, how in the hell could you say that? Or 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 one of those bloodbaths that my dad and Mario Glento gotten into uh, with. Uh, <laughs> And then they had, for those yeah. big monster crowds, they had the world boxing champions. They had Joe Lewis and Mobile. They had Rocky Marciano in Atlanta. I mean, they, wow. you know, as the referees, uh, they knew, Dad knew how to promote. He knew what we needed to do to get the next 20,000. And the that's game. what I oh. think is missing from, you know, and, and especially like, like with me and John, we, 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 see the the pro wrestling guys around here and they're drawn you know a couple hundred people or whatever but they they don't understand the the business part of the wrestling and i think that's the thing that your family understood is that they they needed to get the next twenty thousand people into the building so we got to come up with something yeah 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 it's a great it's a great business wrestling because uh I think it may, it's why I wrote a book. It, it makes you creative. If you're yes. an owner of a company, you got to create ideas. You got to have ideas. If you don't have ideas, you just got plain wrestling out there night after night and nothing special happens and there's no place going. There's no storyline. There's no reason you want to watch the TV every week to see who's <laughs> going to win and, and who's going to yes. get the Cadillac or who's going to get whatever the, <laughs> the prize is. I mean, yeah. Uh, if you don't have that, you don't have a story. 
But if you've got a story and then you've got athletes that can tell it in a physical manner, it's nothing greater than professional wrestling. It's, it's, it's really a mar marvelous thing to be in. That's awesome. I miss that. I miss it greatly. Uh, and I hated to leave it in 1988. But I made money when I sold out. And if yeah. I had stayed in it, I would have not made that money. And uh, in my hockey business, I did have some success there. I paid uh, I paid twenty five thousand. We paid twenty five thousand for that first franchise. We sold that team for seven hundred thousand. Uh, two years later, and uh, <laughs> wow, and, uh, paid fifty thousand dollars for the Cincinnati franchise. I sold my part my part of it for two million. Wow. I paid, so I had, Holy I had crap! I think you made some money there, brother. Fifteen thousand dollar investment that turned into two million. <laughs> It was like, uh, you know, wow. I mean, uh, I, why wouldn't I love hockey, man? <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I really, really enjoyed my hockey years. That's and amazing. my stocks you like to invest in, Mr. Fuller, so I can do that too. <laughs> uh, I, I used to, back in the, uh, when I, when about the time I was writing the book, uh, I was I was retired and yeah. I was living uh, on a big lake there, just out out, out on the edge of Smoky Mountains, yeah. Teleco Lake, and uh, and I got into stocks big time. And I had my IRA account, and I let other people, brokers, uh, you know, decide what I wanted to do and where I was going to put the money and that type of stuff. And then I got to where I was working out in the gym that was playing the stock show every day and they were talking oh about stocks. no <laughs> while i was working out i was listening to the stock deal and uh, and then i got i got hankering i said i'm gonna i'm gonna try to take i'm gonna take over my stocks here you know and i'd been making a little bit off of them oh, but i i here started doing a little research and i found these great companies my gosh one of them was one of the first companies that did domain names Network Solutions was, I think, the name of oh, it. Oh, yes, yes. And, uh, and I just happened upon them, and I said, man, they, this, this computer's going to be big, and these, 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 these names are going to be important, and everybody's going to... I kind of saw the little bit of the picture of it, so... And they were that stock was selling for uh, $37 a share, I think. And I made my first deal. I called my broker my uh, IRA guy, and I said, look, I, I want you to buy me some of this stock. And uh, <laughs> and so two weeks later, after I bought it at 37, two weeks later, it was $370 a share. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> I knew and, it. And, 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 I knew and, and, it. Uh, when you started talking, Rod, I'm like, here we go. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, and, and my stock guy, my, my, my guy in, the, in Cincinnati, he called me up. He says, where in the world did you hear about this company? <laughs> and I hadn't even kept up with it. I said, well, I, I, I was listening, and I just kind of thought it would be good. What's it at? I asked him, what's that? He said, it's a 370. <laughs> and I said, whoa. You know, whoa. So, so uh, I said, I said, I'm thinking, well, let me hang. We're, we're not, we're going to hold on to it for another couple of weeks. And it went to four something. It went over $400. <laughs> and, uh, and then I called him up, and I said, uh, you know, sell that, sell it, sell it. And he says, uh, oh, no, 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 no. He goes, Ron, he goes, he goes I, I'm telling everybody about this stock. He goes, <laughs> hell, man, this is, you've really made a big, 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 big success out of me, man, with this stock. And uh, and I said, he says, why? Why do you want to sell it? And I said, I don't know, man. I just, hey, I made some good money out of it. Let's just sell it. And uh, I sold it. And three days later, it went down to $45. <laughs> I went back to where it was. I was like, wow, man, look at that. How could that happen? And then he called me again, Ron, you must be doing something, man. <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, if he only knew your whole history. <laughs> Just lucky, man. Just lucky. Wow. That's pretty amazing. So uh, this book is, is probably going to be just gangbusters for you after you've laid all this out tonight brother <laughs> uh, yeah well I, I can only hope you know i mean uh there's there's we get no guarantee in life uh that's for sure yeah. and, yes and, uh, yes and indeed I, and i never i uh, don't like to count my chickens before they hatch as they go southern so yes indeed yes you know, indeed but the book I, i'm hoping that the book is going to really uh, uh 
take a take off for me and um, yeah. and uh, it's a it's i think uh, like i said i'm beginning to feel like i may be an author you know i mean <laughs> uh, it, it you know i didn't know whether i was going to be able after six weeks to go wow <laughs> what a bomb that was you know <laughs> But uh, you know now it's it's I'm feeling quite different about it, and I really believe that uh, it's got some potential. It's a good yeah, story. It and is a good story. Anybody that wants to get into a thriller, or, uh, into a story that it's unlike any story I think I've ever read a book about. It, yep. it it takes you everywhere. It takes you all over, and in directions you never expect you're going to go. And you yep. know. Uh, it's got it's got a lot of moments in it uh, where you go wow <laughs> wow where, wow where did that come from so uh, and I think that uh, obviously hopefully that's going to make it a good book and a good seller that's awesome well John do you have any more questions for Ron before we let him go for this evening one little thing um, I noticed by I've watched a lot of the old southeastern on YouTube and things like that you seem to be able to take somebody and make a huge star out of them there that nobody else could. Like, um, there was a lot of good hands that came through, like Johnny Rich, um, and he was huge down there for you. You had a guy, Boomer Lynch, that came through, who was basically an enhancement talent in a lot of other places. You made him into a huge heel down there. What was it that you did, or did you just have a good feeling for it, how to book these guys? Because a lot of the guys that were huge successes for you, they were other places before, and they just didn't seem to get the chance. Did, was it the fact that you actually gave them the chance? Uh, well, in, in some cases, you know, I was really, really lucky. I had a lot of uh, wrestlers that came through in my lifetime as a promoter that uh, were tremendous talent. Uh, uh, one guy, you know, really strikes me right off the bat is Sylvester Ritter. Sylvester Ritter came through my territory. Uh, he was young. He was he was great body, uh, 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 really going to be a major star. I saw that yep. in him, and I did not have a spot for him uh, at that time. I had a, a guy named Norvell Austin, who was uh, my junkyard dog, and uh, and and Sylvester Ritter who wrestled for me as Sylvester Ritter, and I I I, I got Sylvester off to the side, and I said Sylvester. Uh, it's a really bad time. I go, you're you're a great talent. You're going to become a monster star. I said, I want to send you to Bill Watts in Mid South uh, because uh, he'll see your talent and I think he will make you a monster star. And uh, Sylvester Ritter went on to become the the junkyard dog, uh, you know, the big boy junkyard dog, and uh, made Watts a tremendous and and Sylvester a heck of a lot of money and. Uh, uh, Boomer Lynch, the guy you you mentioned there, Boomer Lynch. Uh, uh, when I got him, I put him into my stud stable, and uh, and I I changed his whole name. I changed obviously his name and everything else. And I also at the same time uh, I said I want you to be from South Africa, you know. And he's a white guy, and he says, uh, Ron, I, I you know, and he had a little bit of South African you know, accent, you know. And I said, I want you to be a South African heel. You know, and he's like, oh, well, I, I'll do whatever you want, Ron. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Boomer turned out to be a great worker. Johnny Rich was a tremendous worker and uh, never got a break uh, and maybe probably never would have had he had I not got my hands on him. And I put him at one time with three guys. I made, I had Around two of the first ever three-man teams. The original Midnight Express started for me. It was my concept. I wanted to yep. put Norval Austin, uh, uh uh, Dennis Condry and uh, Randy Rose together as a team, and uh, and then have to, you never knew which two was going to be in the ring, and always the third guy is going to be on the floor, and uh, so I did the same thing with uh, with another three man babyface team, Johnny Rich, wow, uh, Tonka Kid, and uh, and uh, Scott, Scott Armstrong, Armstrong. Yeah. Scott Armstrong, call him the Rat Patrol. Just gave him a crazy name. <laughs> and uh, wow, I mean, you know, it just took off. Uh, so yeah, it, it, but a lot of times though, guys had talent. And they just weren't. It didn't get recognized. People didn't see it. And uh, and I had a little bit of a feel for you know this guy can do it. He just needs to have the right the right gimmick. He needs to have the right yeah. spot. He needs to be put in the right position, and and he'll make money. And uh, a lot of times, That's it tremendous. Works. 
Yeah, I mean, like Tom Pritchard became huge under you. I mean, he got a little bit of a chance out in Portland, came down to Alabama there, and, I mean, he just went great guns for you. But he's another one of those guys that had it. I mean, you know, I couldn't believe that he wasn't a top boy when he came there. You know, I I was thinking, God, how how could anybody not see the potential in this kid? You know, uh, so we just, we took him. Uh, We... We got our hands on guys. Arn Anderson. Arn Anderson came in <laughs> doing jobs for me uh, out of uh, out of uh, Rome, Georgia, and uh, you know just uh, and I said, "Wow, the, what is this guy doing? Doing jobs on TV? I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, he he's got a future here." And uh, you know, honky tonk man. I mean, <laughs> it goes on and on. Uh, but Hulk Hogan, uh, Hulk Hogan came into my company, man, in uh, 1979. In uh, in uh, southeastern down in Pensacola, as a uh, as uh, uh, we, his his name uh, was God. It wasn't Hogan back in the day. <laughs> Sterling <laughs> Golden. We Sterling Golden. Golden. Uh, okay, yeah. You know, he didn't even look like Hulk Hogan. The <laughs> first time I saw him, uh, I went down to work with him, and Louis Tillet was booking for me. He says, "Ron, I got this guy. He's big like you." He he's got something about him. He's got charisma, you know. Uh, can you come down here and and put him over? Because you're over, and he'll get him over. And it was my territory, so I said, hell yeah, I'll come down and put him over. <laughs> and he looked totally different. I mean, he had his he had his chest shaved and with black hair and oh the yeah, door, shaped it. it was a mushroom yeah. cloud thing. Yeah, no, just crazy. Looking. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, what is this guy doing? But uh, you know, the, a lot of guys went on to to have huge careers uh, and started for us. David Schultz, it just keeps going. Yeah, guys that turned out to be big stars, uh, got their got their beginning down down in my companies. Um, just amazing, amazing stuff. Well, Ron, this has definitely been an honor and a privilege. We will definitely have to do this again uh, because I've really enjoyed talking about the book and I know that me and John have really enjoyed talking wrestling with you. And the, the thing that I find absolutely amazing about you is that no matter what the hell you have chose to do, it has been, it's turned out excellent. Even the stock thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just... Told you. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I've been blessed. I've been blessed, really blessed, you know, and, uh, I've been lucky. Uh, yes. I guess that's part of it. You got to have luck to make to be a success too, and uh, you know. So it's it's been it's it's been a hell of a ride. My life's been one hell of a ride. I'm gonna eventually write my book, the book, you know. And uh, maybe I should have done it before before Brutus, but uh, but uh, you know, I kind of like the way I got the I got. I'm gonna try a real book before I try a wrestling book. Well, and but and and it's get to my own. and it's and it's totally classic that you dream this and then you're like i gotta do this <laughs> i gotta do this book <laughs> yeah yeah crazy so crazy that's awesome sure. well I uh see something over there john i get to see what you got in the background and it looks like you got us some southeastern wrestling. i don't know yes, I do. 1984 I... <laughs> southeastern wrestling <laughs> yes i love I easily it. find something like in that fact, on purpose Bob for Armstrong, us. man wow i love it goodness gracious I miss him, guys. Uh, you know, I, I I don't know if y'all were big, huge Bob Armstrong fans. But oh, Bob was, Bob was something else. Love with the wrestling, I seen it, him on Georgia wrestling with Brad, and I was just like, oh my god, he just magnetized you to him. Oh, uh, he, he's he's not just one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. He's one of the greatest human beings of all yeah. time. Yeah. That guy is just truly amazing. Was truly amazing. Uh, but thanks, guys, for having me on. I appreciate. Oh, definitely, it. and I and I will be in touch. I will. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll get this put up on the uh, on the stream and everything this weekend. And uh, I've got your number and I've got your email. And uh, I will definitely be in touch. And maybe we can do this in a month or so. That'd be great. Have uh, you back I appreciate on? Appreciate it. And uh, and uh, keep pushing that Brutus for me, man. You know. I, I hope my line is going to get as bad as he as I wrote him to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, good night, Ron. Have yourself a wonderful evening, sir. Okay, same here, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. And uh, that was fantastic. That was a fantastic interview. Uh, Ron Fuller, the Tennessee stud, tonight here on the uh, Thursday Night Wrestling Show.